dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. If you were to take a poll of famous topics for leadership talks, temperance would not rank in the top 10. For most people, temperance has a negative connotation, as if it were something that would stifle our energies or keep us from the fullness of life. St. Thomas Aquinas has a very different vision for temperance. According to him, temperance is necessary for the full life and has the power to guarantee that we attain the real good and excellence for which we are called. This is why studying it is so important for us today. Okay, everybody, I've got one of our favorite topics to talk about today, one I'm sure that you will all be very enthused about studying, and that is the topic of temperance. Just saying it makes us all so happy. <laughs> temperance means you can't have too much of a good thing. Now, you know, and, and we're all like, is this exactly what we need to talk about? Because, you know, in my life working with business people, I've come to appreciate just how much stress you all carry. And I've also been able by associating with so many of you over the years to come to know how you let off that stress. And most of you find the means of worldly indulgences the key for relaxation. And since you have so much stress and worry on your minds all the time, that relaxation becomes something extremely important, which means me standing in front of you today, you know, wearing sandals and my religious habit and preaching the good news of Jesus Christ is not always a welcome thing because I'm about to tell you about how wonderful it is to be temperate in your usage of the things of this world. <laughs> but I want to challenge you at the same time because it's not that I'm saying you can't have good things. I'm not saying that the gospel is there to say you can't enjoy good things. It's just that you've got to be able to refrain from enjoying too much of them. Not only, so that too much, it's not just a, a super abundance of joy. There's a time even when you're allowed to have a copious amount of good things. I'm thinking of when Mary Magdalene anointed the feet of Jesus and anointed them with so much perfume, an entire year's worth of perfume on his feet. And Jesus found this to be fitting, right? So it's not, it's not a question of quantity alone, but there is a too much. And we need to talk about that and how we find it. Because if we enjoy, enjoy good things too much, they actually become bad things. The good things can actually hurt us. And if I don't have the ability to refrain from that type of bad, that that too much, that excess that actually takes me down, well, then my overindulgence in the good things will actually lead to my ruin. It can take away the nobility of my soul. It can take away the dignity that got me to be where I am in the first place, right? So I'm in a position of power. I'm in a position of leadership. I have the esteem of people around me because I found the good. I found something noble, something wonderful called the harmony of my organization, called the purpose by which I lead, right? The greater, you know, things that my religion and my faith point me towards and keep me constantly awake to. I found those things. I want them. Well, folks, if we don't restrain ourselves or have that ability to restrain ourselves from the things that actually take away from that, we can find ourselves having lost that edge, that wonderful, noble edge that allows us to not just be a person of power, but to be a genuine leader. There's a huge difference between those two. Power comes from the outside. Power is rooted on your position. And therefore, it's actually very weak. Because your position, as you all know, it can be the, uh, like an ejection seat on a, on a cockpit of an airplane, right? Like the next person, boom, you could lose your position. Your board could vote you out. Your people could rebel against you. It, it, in other words, power is weak because it depends upon the opinions of those who choose to bestow it upon you. 
Leadership is not weak because it does not depend upon the opinions of others. It comes from the inside and it's a quality of the soul that you claim by your personal freedom. The more that you gain a sense of who you are and the more what you do flows from who you are, well, the more independent you are from any kind of assault from the outside and the more your power becomes in a sense irrelevant because power just extends your ability to influence the world. But your influence comes from your character and from who you are and that makes you a leader no matter what. Maybe you won't be recognized by the, the soccer moms, right? Who all say to you that you're going to be the queen of the soccer committee, right? <laughs> and maybe, maybe, they've, maybe there's been a turn, you know, and they decide to boot you out. Literally, if you play soccer, you, they gave you the kick and out you went, right? And then you say, oh, this means I'm no good and I'm no longer a leader. No, no, no. You're like, that's fine. I'll lead somewhere else because my leadership comes from who I am. It comes from deep inside. My, the fact that I've laid claim to the freedom of my soul and I know what I want to do and I know how to get there. Well, everyone knows that that freedom can be corrupted from the inside. Power can be lost on the outside, but leadership can be lost from the inside. In other words, if I corrupt and I lose that wonderful edge that allows me to say, I am a woman dedicated to the good. I am a woman who's going to lead my people towards what's authentically right and just. Well, that means that I've got to be able to myself say, there's a too much to these things, right? I can enjoy things and we can enjoy everything, but we're not here for enjoyment, right? <laughs> the enjoyment, the relaxation that we can gain from things, it's to get us back into the project of the mission that we have in front of us. And therefore, if we enjoy them improperly, well, we've actually, we've actually kind of corrupted because we're no longer going for that mission as if that was the reason we're here. And this is something Jesus warns us about in the gospel. It's right in Luke 21. He says, but watch yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. Isn't it interesting? He actually says, you know, be, take care, watch yourselves so that your heart will not be weighed down. And then he speaks about it with carousing, right? Or dissipation, with drunkenness, right? So the, the overindulgence of good things can actually weigh down your heart, weigh down your soul. Weigh it down. It's an, it's an interesting image. In Greek, it actually says barithosin. And barithosin is the word for to weigh down. And it comes from the Greek word baros, which means weights. And it's used in the same way as when they say their eyes got heavy, for example, when you're sleepy and your eyes are just have like weights attached to them and they weighing you down. Or when you burden a donkey with something and you put all this weight on it. That's the exact Greek word that Jesus is saying will happen to your heart if you don't take care. Now, so, so obviously we're all like, well, not my heart. I don't want it to be weighed down. I need to be on my point. I need to be on my A game. I got to be able to lead my people and figure out how to get around a recession or figure out how to overcome the competition that we have or how to redefine and innovate our project, product lines. I mean, I have to do all kinds of things. Exactly. You don't have time to be weighed down, everybody. Well, Jesus says, here's what's going to weigh you down. In part, amongst many other things, the cares of life, right? The drunkenness and the carousing or dissipation of soul. Now, obviously, we've got to make a, a fine line between relaxing and enjoying, which Jesus did, right? And he teaches us it's okay to do. I mean, remember when the three kings brought him gold, right? He didn't say no. Enough of this gold. No, they took the gold and then they used it, right? I mean, Mary and Joseph had to live off of something while they were in Egypt. But the real question is, can there be too much? And where is the virtue of temperance? Where does it shine in my life as a leader? And there, it's really important and wonderful. Being a temperate leader is more than being someone in control of their ability to eat and drink. No, no, no. It's going to be your ability to stay on target and your ability to do wonderful things consistently for your people in good times and bad. And that's something we need to study. Does your family matter? Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a family mission infographic 
that will help you focus on your family. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So let's take a look at what St. Thomas Aquinas teaches us about temperance. Now, I know you can go to many different sources to learn things, and many of them are good. I just love St. Thomas Aquinas, and I want you to get to know this fellow because in very succinct language, he puts out truths that really can imbue our soul with light and truth. And he synthesizes the, the thought of antiquity into play, a place where Christianity can easily take grasp of it. Right? So we take everything from the Bible, we take everything from, from Christianity, from our tradition, and then we look back and we say, but how can I understand this? And Aquinas puts it really beautifully in a wonderful sentence. He says, the word temperance signifies a certain temperateness or moderation, which reason appoints to human operations and passions. And that temperance withdraws man from things which seduce the appetite from obeying reason. And that's the key. So your ability to withdraw, to hold back, the Latin word he uses for this is retrahere, which is to, to pull back, to pull back. It's like the reins on a horse. If you have temperance, you're, you say, I've got this appetite like a horse, and horses can be smart, but they're really not as smart as the rider, and the horse is going to charge forth towards where its instinct takes it to go. The rider's job is to steer that horse and use its power, and together they make an incredible team. The intelligence of the human being, the natural instinct and power of the horse, united. And there you've got a warrior. You've got something, a, 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 an ability to move yourself in a tremendous way. Or think of the same thing in a modern example of an airplane and the pilot. The airplane has all the power, it's got all, but it needs the pilot to be able to, to fly that plane, right? Well, the human being is a very similar construct. We have reason that identifies for us the good and the true good, right? And this true good draws me. When I really see it is a good thing for me to sell my business, well, then we kick into gear and we go around trying to sell the business and we'll go through four to six months of pain and legal fees and all kinds of hoopla in order to do what we've determined is really good, right? Because we're drawn to what is really good. And if we don't stay on our game and we allow the natural instincts of our body and of our flesh to overindulge, it can move us away from where we need to be. We can lose our ability to negotiate. We can fly off the handle. We can lose that edge that makes us a leader to begin with. We've got to always remember leadership is not automatic. Leadership is the quality of the mind to see the end goal and to see the ways to get there and to create viable relationships with the people in your organization who are organized to reach that end. You've got to have, therefore, a lot of tenacity, a lot of intelligence, and a lot of inner drive. And if we allow ourselves to simply go after things that are easy and pleasant, right within our reach, too much, we can focus our energies there and lose that ability to hit the long-term goal that will determine whether or not we're successful. We need the ability and ability to pull back on the reins, to hold back on the natural instinct that thrusts us forward into things that are lesser than us in order to steer the ship correctly all the way to its end goal. And all we need to do is look at examples in our own life where we saw people incapable of doing that and that incapacity to do that has brought about the failure and suffering for ourselves. And that convinces us of the importance of this. Now remember, that easy and pleasant thing is not always something that's a donut, for example, on your way to work. Well, of course, if you're doing intermittent fasting, having that donut will throw off your entire fast. If you're on the keto diet, having that donut is like the next thing to death. And yet we're so tempted to have it, right? So we need the ability to say, ah, I am going to pull back, retrahere. I'm going to pull back the reins on that desire to keep myself where I know is the authentic good. It is good to eat donuts. 
And I come from the Midwest, right? I come from the land of the donut. I believe in donuts. <laughs> I am not saying bad things about donuts. I love them too. It's just that when I'm trying to lose weight and I'm trying to have a good, you know, uh, mental energy level throughout the day, well, that donut is not good. It could taste good. It could look good, but it's not good. I, I need the good that will keep my mind focused appropriately. So there's a time and a place for a donut and there's a, a time and a place where donuts are wonderfully good. It's not just because something tastes good that it is good. All right. Is that simple enough for everybody? It's not, it's not just because something tastes good that it is good. It's not because alcohol has a, an ability to relax the body that it's always appropriate. You know, there's a time and a place for it. And there's also a limitation for how much it should be enjoyed. And what we'll do is we'll rationalize. We'll be like, ah, oh, well, you know, everyone needs a little this or that. And I'm like, everyone does need a little of it, but it needs to be circumscribed by appropriateness. The good that we're trying to attain, in other words, as a leader, is something that our minds have seen to not just be worthy of effort, but to be worthy of effort in the circumstances of our life and worthy also of the, the sacrifices that that effort is going to require from us. And therefore, I need to constantly be at, on guard, lest by a dissipation of soul towards other things that are good but that, that are distracting, could actually take my eyes off of the ultimate prize that I need. But I was saying, before I got distracted by donuts, that it's not just the things of the flesh that are sugary and sweet that constitute what draws us out. It can also be things like anger, impatience, cursing. That's all a sign of intemperance. It's easy to curse. It, it, it's easy to get angry. It's easy to, to throw things around. And we can act all blustery because actually we lack the strength to pull back the reins on that and to do what's appropriate and right in the time necessary to hit the target. I think it's a, there's two types, in other words, of anger. There's the blustery anger that flies off the handle because the person who possesses it lacks the wherewithal to curb it. And, it, and then there's the cold anger that actually channels the pain into assertiveness and productivity. And a cold anger is a very focused thing. The cold anger is saying, I'm going to respond to everything that's irritating me here by a productive, positive action. Well, that t that's the sign of a temperate person. Okay? Temperance in leadership is essential because it builds trust. If you want your people to trust you, demonstrate to them your ability to bring them to the desired goal again and again and again without being distracted by the things that in fact dissipate the energy of the organization. You want to tell me that that doesn't flow from a character of a person? I mean, how much more confidence would you have working for someone whose energy is focused so exclusively on what you need to attain that, you've, that, that they won't get distracted by simply giving themselves up to carelessness of words, of speech, of gossiping? That's another sign of intemperance, right? Any, anything that, that can, in a sense, demonstrate to you that they're not all in. A temperate leader is an attractive leader because a temperate leader shows their people that they're all in and that where they're going is that important to them that they're personally committed to it. And when you are personally committed to it, your people will be personally committed as well. Temperance is, is the key for leadership to draw people after them because you demonstrate to everyone your own commitment to that good. Would you like your business to become a virtuous workplace? Would you like Father Nathan to come to an event in your town? Visit www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash r-events and join for free today. So we all want to be temperate. We all know that it's important to refrain from too much or too many sensible goods because it takes away our edge. All right, that's a good point. But what Aquinas teaches us about temperance is a little bit more nuanced than that. He actually says the problem with temperance isn't that things are pleasant. And, and he says, let's be sure, pleasures can be used. 
by the leader in order to attain the end toward which, which they're leading. In other words, if you can't relax and if you can't enjoy the good things, you will also lose your edge. Right? We, all, we all need to enjoy the good things of this earth. And Aquinas says the evils don't come from the fact that things are pleasant. That's not where it's evil. The evil comes when those things take us away from the reasonable good that we're trying to attain. All right, so I can use the things of this earth and I need to use the things of this earth in order to actually lead and lead well. And we think of this with Jesus in his own example. Uh, uh, Jesus ate and he drank. He had meals. You don't think when he was over at the house of Matthew that he didn't enjoy the meal or when he had a meal with Martha and Mary and Lazarus right before going into his passion, right? I mean, Jesus enjoyed the things of this earth, but he enjoyed them as a tool by which he would then be able to even better attain the purpose for his life. The problem, says Aquinas, is when those things can distract you and can take you away, instead of you using them, in other words, they use you. All right? It's a very simple principle. We're supposed to love the things that are above us more than we know them. And we're supposed to know the things that are below us more than we love them. Again, whenever you're dealing with Catholic saints, you're always dealing with things that are a little bit confusing, but very poetic, right? But it makes a lot of sense, right? I'm not supposed to give myself as a slave to the things that are below me. I am a leader because I'm trying to attain a a rational goal. And I have the responsibility of the organization to make sure we get there, right? So therefore, I use the things that are below me. I know them and I use them for that greater good of the harmony and the success of the many in a wonderful, encouraging organization and work environment. Wow, that's amazing. That's my goal. So I can use wine. I can use chocolate. I can use parties. I can use uh, a nice chair in my office, all in order to keep me focused on what I'm trying to attain and to allow us to do that well, because that goal is worthy. So what's so hard about it? Well, what's so hard about it is that just like I can be afraid of things. And because I'm afraid of things, I can not dare to face them. And I can withdraw from trying to achieve great things because of the fears that are around me. Even so, the pain of the absence of certain pleasant things can keep me from curbing my desire for those pleasures. So the real enemy to me becoming a temperate leader is the fact that it hurts. <laughs> it hurts not to have that, those comforts, right? It, it, think of it this way. Think of it when you might have a, an, a relationship with someone that you're working with a colleague who actually is a bad advisor, but you really enjoy their company. And so you keep them on, you keep them coming to meetings, et cetera, because you enjoy their company, but they're actually not helping you, right? So there you've got a desire that's, that's I mean, it might be nice to have that person, but they're actually hurting the cause for the long term. But it's really hard for you to think of separating yourself from that colleague because in the end, while well, you kind of, you've kind of promised them things, you kind of said nice things to them and then, oh, I got to have that conversation, right? Well, now look at how that can hurt the entire organization. Look at how that can hurt your leadership. But it hurts to think that I would have to separate myself from that environment. That's a lack of temperance. It's a, and because I'm afraid, in other words, of the, the pain that comes from the absence of the pleasure of having that person that I just enjoy being with me. So there's, of course, ways around that. You could always redefine the position, redefine the relationship. You can find, but it's, it takes a lot of work, right? Well, yeah, sometimes it takes a lot of work and it's a painful thing to become a virtuous, excellent leader. And I agree with that. And that's why there are so few of them. But Christ is calling us to enter into that. And don't you think that Jesus has something that, to say about that? I mean, wherever there's a hole in our life, an absence in our life, from something that fills us with things that are under us or lesser than us, it's actually an opening that can open us into a union with God and a union with Jesus that can give us a heck of a lot more strength than taking a cruise or whatever else that we need. And again, I'm not putting those things down. It's important to take care of the body and the psyche. It's very important, especially when you're under so much stress. 
It's just that Jesus wants us to love him as the purpose for everything that we do. And that love for him is a deep secret inside of our heart that enables us to do the most amazing things. And it keeps us in the game a lot longer than anything that's below us. And the, 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 the spiritual struggle for the Christian leader is that we have to be engaged in the things that are below us. And we have to enable those good things to feed us to a degree because we're weary and we're a part of this world. But we mustn't ever allow those things to fill the hole in our heart that only God can fill. To define ourselves constantly, in other words, by what's above us, by the love that is before us. And so there, a good fast, right? A good legitimate deprivation from legitimate goods, right? Where I could and I, I, I should do this is a wonderful technique to keep alive the fire of the Spirit. And I remind everybody that Fridays, by canon law of the Catholic Church, need to be marked by a spirit of penance and even to be, need to be marked by an actual act of penance. And what's one thing you can do coming away from this class? You could say to yourself, every Friday I'm actually going to fast. Now, an easy way to do that is fasting from alcohol, fasting from a dessert. Obviously, that's easy. Well, could I not do that every Friday? Could I not one day a week? I remember one time I talked with a guy who said, I never drink on weekdays. It's part of my fast. It's part of my service. I'll drink on the weekends if necessary, but I won't drink during the weekdays. There's a simple rule like that. Those simple kind of things can go a long way for us to a keeping the fire alive deep inside. That reminds us that what we're actually trying to do is a glorious and an amazing thing. I am the servant of the Most High God, running an organization to make this world better. And I won't let anything get in my way to deter me from that noble end. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.